the way, Lori, back to this quadratic expression. Yeah? Or she would end up with p squared plus 4p plus 4. Ah. So, uh, well, we kind of answered the second one too, right? Just by checking to see if it works, we find that it doesn't. Okay, so um, uh, for factorization, doesn't multiply to make the same expression. Okay. And uh, it's kind of hard to, it's a pretty simple problem. Uh, how could she have checked she could have multiplied them together? So what is the correct factorization of this polynomial? There is a one. What? There isn't one. There isn't one. It's not possible to multiply two numbers together to make four and take those same two numbers and add them together to make two. The only way you can add to make two is one and one, or two and zero. Neither of those multiply together to make four. What do you mean one? What's that? What do you mean one? Oh, I guess we know. We could do something like three negative one, but then you wind up with a, a negative product. So just. Mm -hmm. Nothing seems to be working. Nothing's working out for us. Okay, so this, this little note is yellow to remind me that uh, there's like a little something that I didn't explicitly say last time intentionally because it doesn't, you don't have to know it to be able to do this. Okay, so Rick fed from this quadratic expression correctly. Here's his work. So why did Rick rewrite the expression with a zero B in it? quickly write down why you would do that. Oh, yeah. hold on. Let me get to the second one, because those of you have the, the print out. So why would he do that? Why would re Rick rewrite this as having a zero B? Because it's not like a B value, and it means that the two factors in this case do not add up. They mean zero. Yeah, they add up. They add up to zero. Okay. So just to show himself that uh, we want to add up to nothingness, right? When we get our B terms, we want them to add to nothing. Um, he wrote zero B. To show that the, the two numbers need to add to zero. Um, so did that and he says, okay, so two numbers need to multiply to make a negative 81, and then they need to add up to nothing. So we choose this 9 and negative 9, 9 times 9 is 81, positive and negative is negative, and 9 minus 9 is 0. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of a special situation. Maybe you see it, or maybe you don't. To help you see it, I want you to list three other examples of expressions containing a zero B, like this one, where there's like no B term, uh, or zero X, whatever, that factor the same way this one does. So I'm going to write three more examples of, uh, of quadratics that would factor just like this one would. And we'll notice maybe a pattern that arises after we figure that out.
that, it, that, that brings up an important point, though. So let, let's just go off of uh, somebody have one example. Who has one example? B squared minus 16. Okay, how does that factor? Four. Mm -hmm. Plus four. Plus four. Minus four. Minus four. So he's going to multiply to make this guy, and then they need to add together to make nothing. <coughs> Zero. How about another one? Yeah, Corey? B squared minus eight. Uh, let's leave that one. Four. Four. Four, okay. B squared. Minus four. I like that you said it doesn't work. Um, two. Or two? B squared minus two? B squared. Oh, I don't know why I did that. See? I was don't thinking about something else. Two and two, yes. And one, one last example. That. Oh, okay. B squared minus 25. Now, Gordon, you said. When you gave me the example of eight, you said, oh, that doesn't work. Why'd you say that? Because there is no like normal number square root that would be fit into repeating decimals. That so this number needs to have a square root? Yeah. Why? Because if it doesn't have a square root, then you can't like multiply it to get 16 and still have two identical numbers that you can cancel each other out. But if I'm not, maybe we should, instead of identical, maybe we should call them opposite. They need to be exact opposites because they need to add and eliminate each other. But then those two numbers also need to multiply and make the, uh, the constant. So two numbers that are exactly opposite because they need to add and eliminate each other uh, would multiply to make this number. That's the definition of a square number. A square number has two identical numbers that multiply together makes that number. Okay. So this is the, the yellow part of it, uh, reminding me to tell you about this new explicit piece of information. This is called a difference. Why is it called a difference? This pattern right here, these are all the differences. Why are these called differences? Subtraction is, is uh, different. But the difference between two numbers means that you subtract one from the other. Difference of two squares. This thing right here needs to be a square because it's going to be this times that, b times b is b squared. This needs to be a square number because it's going to have two, these two opposite numbers, positive four, negative four, uh, that are going to add to uh, zero. We need to multiply together to make that number. That's that's a square number. Okay. Now, could we do? This, this brings up a good point. Could we do b squared minus eight? How would that factor? Which you would find by doing what? Taking the square root of eight. Taking the square root of eight. So you just call it square root of eight, and b minus the square root of eight. So I thought this one. So really, any any difference will work as long as we're willing to look at the square root. And you know, we'll use it. We don't use that decimal because it's probably a b of twelve. It'll definitely be a rounded off decimal. And when you multiply that rounded off decimal by rounded off decimal, it's not going to be correct. You're going to be off by like by a little bit, right? But but by off by something. We don't want to be off, we want to be exact. So square root of eight, let's write that as exact. What about uh, b squared plus 25? Okay, so that's a square, that's a square. Is that gonna work? Because it's positive, what does that matter? True, I mean, it doesn't meet difference of squared. What about a sum of squares? Let's just call it a sum of squares. Would that work? Would that factor? No, because the middle wouldn't cancel. Because the middle wouldn't cancel, why not? Because you can't multiply these two positive numbers and not add them. Together. Right. So either we're going to have two positive numbers multiplied together to make 25, or two negative numbers multiplied to make positive 25. Either way, they're not going to cancel each other out. They're going to add them together. Okay. So not to say we can't get tricky with this. Use complex numbers and um, the imaginary number, but we won't do that. So difference of squares, yes. Sum of squares, not with real numbers at least. Won't be factorable. Um, yeah, difference of squares, we can treat any number like a square number if we write its square root, so it's just a square root. Okay. On to the next one. We should we should have this one ready, right? Am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll pass it the fourth one when it's relevant. I want you to focus. Alright, so Carl. Factors this quadratic expression incorrectly. So why?
why is it Carlos related to? Why did he choose those? It's the, the, the most likely reason that he did that. That's why Carl liked it. That's why he liked eight and two. But what's the what's the reason? It's almost for sure that he picked eight and two. What's the other thing he said? Is that second thing he said? No. What did that second thing he said? Read your own answer. Uh, you don't have to answer. Uh, it's eight times two is sixteen. Eight times two is sixteen. That's that's the thing, right? Because you you need to multiply those two constants together. And sixteen. Um. And, and we know that when we're multiplying it together, that, that 8 times 2 needs to be that constant. It's so simple as that because 8 times 2 equals 16. But why are 8 and 2 the, the incorrect answer or the incorrect choice? <coughs> so the um, middle variable, um, 8 plus 2 does not equal so when we multiply together, we need to get, we're going to get 8x and 2x, and 8x plus 2x is not 8x. We need it to add up to 8x. So because 8 plus 2 does not equal 8. So now we feel wrong. We're going to help Carl out and suggest what? Four and four. Four and four. Four times four is sixteen. Four plus four is eight. All right. It's a yellow sticky here. <coughs> See, and there's something kind of uh, special about this. Do you notice anything interesting about what we see with once we factor it? What's a perfect square? Well, this is a constant, so we don't call it a variable. No. This is a square. Yeah, that's relevant. This is a square, and what's the square root of it? Four. four, and this is two times four, right? This two times the square root of that guy. All right. So when that happens, we can have x squared plus. Okay, let's call this. Um, let's call it b squared, right? Some number that's a perfect square, and when we take the square root of b squared whatever that number is, that, that square root of that will be b, right? So we multiply it by itself, we get b squared. So when this is two times b, the square root of this number times x, then this will happen, right? What happened here? What's interesting about these two factors? They're exactly the same. They're exactly the same. That doesn't happen all the time. That happens um, you know, less rarely than it, uh, than it happens. So we could write it like this, x plus four, times x plus 4 would be the definition of x plus 4 squared. Okay. That's why we call this a perfect square. Because it factors as a perfect square. We, we get the two factors multiplied together. They're identical, so we can write it as a perfect square. A perfect square trinomial. What's tri mean? What does, what does nomial mean? Numbers, you can think of it as numbers or terms. That's what we have. Three numbers, three terms. If that's a trinomial, then what's this? A binomial. And what's this? Monomial. Monomial, right? Mono meaning by yourself. Right? You got stereo and you got mono. Is that even something you know these days? Stereo would be two speakers and mono would be just one speaker. Monotone, when someone talks to 
with one tone all the time and doesn't go up and go down, it's monotone. Then you one tone. Asleep. Then you fall asleep. Or monotheistic, right? Mm -hmm. Believe in one God. Mono. What? <laughs> I think that's M A N O. This is a uh, mono is M O N O. Uh, mono e mono, I think. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Just one on one, is that? Yeah. Maybe that is a thing. Okay, moving along. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pass this out. Yeah. Pass this out. Why are Judas' solutions incorrect? What part of this shows Judas' so, uh, solution? What part of her work shows what her solutions are? The bottom part. The very last thing she writes down, W is this, W is that. Okay, so something's wrong about those. Why is that wrong? Why don't you write that down? You know the printouts that I gave you or in your notebook or whatever? How do the printouts work? And how do you like them? What you thought? Okay. Is anybody jealous by the printouts? <laughs> no? So this goes back to this uh, discussion we've had a few times about the word solution and what it means. So think about that as you write this down and as you answer, how do you know Judas' sol solutions are incorrect? What do you think? Yeah, TJ, you can uh, make the uh, equation true. Make sure you do it consistently. Because that's exactly right. Because they don't make the equation true. That's the definition of a solution. If you have a solution, you plug it in and it makes the equation true. That's how you know. That's what it is. Okay? So, why are the solutions incorrect? Solution has a definition. They don't meet that definition. Because, this takes too long. We'll say the last time now. Because. Take this solution, we put it up here, it's these w's, and it should come out to be zero. Okay. So just for example, we'll take negative 12. Uh, negative 12 squared minus 16 times negative 12 plus 48. Negative 12 squared, 144. Negative 16 times negative 12 uh, will be Plus 48, is that zero? No. That's not zero. Doesn't make it true. It's not true. What would make it true? Positive 12. Well, how, did, how in the world did Judith wind up with negative 12 instead of positive 12? Because you put it back in the letter. Not the equation you're referring to, and it's by referring to zero. Uh, so, so Judith was probably getting a little ahead of herself done a few of these. She recognized, obviously, like there's a, it's a short step between this to your solution. But if you're not following that step or you don't realize that you're supposed to take that step, you might wind up in this, in this camp right here where you just take this as the solution. This needs to be equal to zero. And solve this equation, you get positive 12. It should be positive 12. So 
same one here, this should wind up being the solution that's positive. So the number for w that causes this to be zero or causes this to be zero. Um, Question, why is it incorrect that easy equation is equal to AB? Write that on down to the middle. See over on this side, she did factor this correctly. R times R plus two, if you distribute it, it does give you R squared plus two R. And then, you know, true to form, like this equation, set the one factor equal to, you know, this side of the equation equals zero. But here it was just 80, so she set it equal to 80. But why is that wrong? Like, why can't she use 80? What, what should it be? Okay, well, hold on. Brett? Is it the, is it gonna make the expression true or whatever? Because setting it equal to 80 doesn't make it true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess we, we can kind of, we could build off of that a little bit and see what we can have to say. Um, like a big quadratic function are typically set equal to zero. Okay, so they're set equal to zero. So what should it be equal to zero? Answer that question. Do out the equation and make it equal to b. Do out what equation? You could you could do r times r plus uh -huh. b, and it could come out as eighty because of the right value for r. If you yeah sure if you found the right value for r, then uh, then certainly this side could be equal to eighty if you found the right value of r. Yeah, so it's not necessarily wrong. Well, if we're going to jump down to this step, where we set this equal to that and this equal to that, that thing should be zero. That's what we're trying to get. Why is that? Why can't it be equal to 80? Or why is, you know, using this method, setting it equal to 80 is not going to correct that. I think that your answer will be 80 off. 80 off? Um, factor the left side, and you may not uh, quite get this part, but we're setting it not just equal to this, whatever it is, but equal to zero for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of change the course of what you're looking at? Gordon? Setting it equal to zero allows us to graph it on the x-axis and not send it all the way down. Yeah. That that kind of gets to it. We haven't quite made that jump uh, officially into x intercept. But yeah, there's a connection, but that's not quite, that doesn't quite explain the equation, the, the arithmetic part of it, the algebra part of it. I mean, 
mean, what am I saying here? I'm taking r times r plus 2, setting it equal to the 80, and then saying, by this statement, I am concluding that r has to be 80. What justification am I using for that? How can I say that? Is that a guarantee? That if I multiply these two together, this has to be 80? That wouldn't even work. I mean, 80 <coughs> times 82, right? 80 plus 2 is not 80. So we can't do that. We just, she just, whoever the dude was, what was his name? Daryl said. <laughs> Daryl says what? Daryl. Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> can like, write the expression equal to 80, yeah. but he's wrong in saying that r has to be 80. It's. That part's wrong, not the expression. Um, well, this is an expression. This is an expression. This is an equation. Well, the equation, the equation can be written like that because yes. even saying r equals eighty is wrong. Right. Because it doesn't come out to equal eighty when you set r to eighty. Right. You could, you could, you could argue that for sure. You could do, you, you'd be right about that. It's not that it's being equal to eighty is wrong. It's really the next step, the assumption part, or the the statement that he's making. That that part's wrong. Because we can't multiply. 80 out to get 80 when you multiply 80. Right. Times you have to do 80 plus. times 1, but r also needs to be 80, so you can't do 80 times 1. So you would end up with 82 times 80. Right. So that doesn't come out to be right. So the thing is, is a common mistake that I see a lot, especially if it starts out this way. So we'll just factor this out, take this, set it equal to the right side, okay? Because they think of it as the right side, not as 0. Why is it so important that it's 0 rather than 80? Um, well, if, if I didn't have this, say, say it was just this quadratic expression, it wasn't an equation. I mean, this is factored correctly. This part is factored, correct factorization of that. And since we don't know what the solution is, we could plug in whatever the formula felt like for r and come up with it. And just well, hypothetically, we could come up with a number for r that would give us 80. Right. The solutions will solve this equation. They'll solve this equation. They'll solve an equation where we rearrange it so it's equal to 0. They'll solve all those equations. We can so set the equation to equal whatever we want. Right. But if we're going to use the method where we factor, and then we set each factor equal to this, this what's on the right side, this what's on the right side has to be 0. That's, that's the point I'm making. So he's not mathematically wrong. He's wrong in that he used a different procedure. Um, and at that step, he's wrong at the next step. And then we all know that, but. Well, if he's going to use factorization, it's, it's got to be can't be equal to 80 if you're going to use factorization. Because there's a, a central idea to the, to the method of factorization, and that is that it's equal to 0. Why is that, though? Why does it have to be equal to 0? Why can't it be equal to 80? Why doesn't he be able to set the equation to be 0? Here, let's, let's, let's work it out using equals 0. So how do we get the other side to be 0? Subtract 80, r squared plus 2r minus 80 equals 0. Okay, we're going to factor this guy. It's going to multiply to make negative 80 and add to make 2. So we must use a positive and a negative to multiply. And so what do we get? That's just me. Positive 10 and negative 8. Positive 10, negative 8. Okay, so now it's, it's factored. This also factors. And now it's equal to 0. Why is it so important that it's equal to 0? the next step? Graphing it. Nope. <laughs> Finding the zero. Um, Gordon? It has to be equal to zero so that when we plug in like r plus 10 equals zero, we can set like r as negative 10 and then it will come out as zero no matter what at the rest of the equation. Right. Because the idea we're using here is that a number times another number is zero. There's a, there's a guaranteed conclusion from saying that. If I multiply two numbers together and get zero, I know absolutely something 
about the left side of the equation. Here, I have no idea. This could be almost anything. I as mean, as theoretically, it could be 80, right? 80 times 1 is 80, but oh, that doesn't work because I have to put 80 for this R, too. It could be 40, right? 40 times 2. Well, this has to be 40. That's not going to come out to be 2, right? So there is no guarantee, but over here, it's guaranteed that one of them has to be 0. Because the only way to multiply two numbers together, or three numbers, or four numbers, and get 0 is for one of them to be 0. While on the other side, it could be, it could be 15 different numbers that you could plug in, and in some way you could come out with 80, right? This Actually, time. there's only two numbers that you can plug into this expression and get 80, and we're about to find them. Okay. Okay. So it's guaranteed that this has to be 0 or this has to be 0. There's no other numbers that they could be. This can't be 1 and this be 2. If this is 1, this would have to be 0. If this is 2, this would have to be 0. You have to multiply by 0 to get 0. That's why it's so important to have the answer be 0, because then you can guarantee that one of these has to be 0. And once one of those is 0, then it's just it's an easy matter. equation to solve. r equals negative 10, r minus 8 equals 0, r equals 8. So those two numbers will also satisfy this equation. Negative 10 uh, times negative 8, positive 80. 8. 8 times 8 plus 2 is 10. 8 times 10, positive 8. Those are the only two numbers that will satisfy any so of these equations. So either way, you have two solutions, though. Yeah. So back to the beginning, what's the difference if you come out with two same two answers? You tell me how you're going to use this setup to come up with the solutions, other than just plugging in numbers randomly and guessing and checking. There isn't one. That's what I'm saying. But mathematically, it's still correct because you can still get the same solution. Right. But how will you get those solutions is, my, is what I'm saying. Right. So it's not the fact that he's mathematically wrong. It's the fact that he set it up right. in a way that you cannot it's not mathematically that find. the equation is incorrect. Right? The procedure is incorrect. Okay. If you're going to use the factoring procedure, I'm not saying that his equation is incorrect. But it leads into the to an incorrect conclusion that this must be 80 or this must be 80. Um, I guess I could I could word it like why would leaving the quadratic leaving the quadratic expression equal to 80 uh, cause call, call, cause Daryl to get the wrong solution. Gonna, he's using the idea of factoring. That's what he's doing. But he's mistakenly thinking that the procedure says factor the left side, set each factor equal to the right side, and then solve those equations. The right side has got to be zero if you're going to use factoring. If you don't use factoring, then maybe you can solve this equation. But it's not going to be very easy. A very easy way to do it is set it equal to zero, factor it, then set each of the factors equal to zero. Equations are incorrect. This step is incorrect, and it was arrived at because he left it as that, assuming that this should be equal to that and this should be equal to that. However, you need to reword that for it to make you feel better. That's what I'm trying to get at. People use factoring all the time, uh, or, or it happens quite a bit, and someone will do exactly that. Set that equal to 80. Set the other thing equal to 80. Solve it, and say those are my solutions. Um, you could say. does it correctly. Ooh, found the zeros of the function correctly and it work. So how does she know that y should be zero? That's the first question.
the, the, the other side of the equation doesn't need to be zero, the use factor. Use some other idea, you know, there are other ways of solving quadratics. But if we're going to use factoring, it's got to be equal to zero. Um, but that's not quite why y needs to be zero. Okay. This question might be a little more challenging because it has to do with the fact that this is yellow and that it's, it's an idea we didn't explicitly discuss. But I mean, the, the process is exactly the same. Okay. The vocabulary is a little bit different. Anybody have? So the reason she knew is because that's what she was asked to do. Right. It's all right here. It's all in the in the question or the instruction. Right. Let's let's start right here. What is a function? Keep talking about it. Did you raise your hand? There you go. You summed it all up. The whole thing. Inputs with one output, which implies that there's inputs and outputs. Things go into function. And then the function does its work, and then something comes out. Okay, and not not only that, but it only has one output; it doesn't have several outputs or zero outputs. Okay. So, what a function does is what we're really interested in it doing is making outputs. Right. What comes out of the function is the thing that we care about. What goes into the function is kind of standard. Like all, almost all functions just take any number in, and whatever they all take the same number: zero, one, two, three, four. What comes out, that's what makes the function unique to other functions. Um, so when we say zero of the function, I mean, when does the function make zero? When does it produce zero? When does it output zero? Right? And so what's the output of this function? Zero, and which letter represents the output? Y. Why? Why? Why is the output? This whole factory here, right? We want it to make a zero. We want it to find out what we give it to make a zero. Okay, so we make the output zero, and we proceed as normal. Okay. Um, kind of rewording what the instructions are saying, what the directions are saying. It wants the function to be worth zero. When you said it's zeros of a function, you mean that the function is worth zero, and the worth of a function is what it what it makes, what it outputs. If we make the output zero, um, um, let's say, How does Carol know that each factor would have to be equal to zero? That she can say that it would have to be equal to zero? How does she know that? How does she make this jump from here to here? How does she make the jump from this stuff equals zero to this would have to be zero or this would have to be zero? <coughs> Mark on that. How does she know that she can just say that? She can just say that the factors would have to be equal to zero, or that one would have to be equal to zero, or the other would have to be equal to zero. What's that? Well, this is her work, like the stuff that oh. she did, what she wrote down. How did she know to do that? How did she know that that was. She's making quite a statement. She's saying it has to be that making a conclusion, an inference from the line above it to x plus 10 equals 0. Yeah, Brett? Does it go 
go back to what you said about function functions having um, one output. So if you had like like a topic that y that says that it could potentially be like anything, uh -huh. but when you have zero, that makes it that one output. What is zero makes it that? Because it's it's a real number instead of just some letter. Instead of just y. Could represent multiple numbers or many numbers. Okay, I guess um, what I'm saying is like if, if this were not a zero, if it were a one instead, could you just say, well, that would have to be equal to one? Could you say that? product of these two things was equal to 1, that doesn't mean that this has to be 1. So why is it that when we go back and we say, it's not 1, it's 0, why can we just say, if that is 0, then this would have to be 0. Or, let's say, or, this would have to be 0. How, why are we drawing that conclusion? How do we know that that has to be? Right? That's a huge part of it. If this is zero, and you multiply this by zero, you'll get zero. Okay? Now, what you're, you're making a, an implication of, of, of one direction saying, if I multiply by zero, I get zero. Let's go the other way. If I get zero, then is there any way to do that other than one of those things being zero? It has to be. It has to be zero. If we're multiplying these two things together and get zero, one of them has to be zero. There's no other way. Now, if that's one, we don't have to multiply one by some things to get one. There's lots of things we can multiply together that are one that don't include multiplying by one. But if we get zero, you have to have multiplied by zero. This is a really important point that as we move on, we try to solve more complicated uh, quadratics or even higher order polynomials, meaning that instead of x squared, maybe we have x to the third, things like that. Uh, this idea is really crucial. You've got to get that what we're saying here, the reason we have zero over here is to say that this times this equals zero, and if we multiply two things together and get zero, we have to have used zero. One of these, either this one has to be zero, or this one has to be zero. Uh, zero product property. That could be our answer, because that's exactly what the zero product property is. I'll state it for you right now. If a number times a number equals zero, then A is zero, or B is zero. If A is not zero and B is not zero, there are two non-zero numbers, there's no way you multiply them together and get zero. One times two, no. Two times three-fourths, no. Negative six times 0.75, no. The only way to get zero when you multiply is to multiply by zero. That's what the zero product property says. And that's what we're taking advantage of here. I'm going to restate that several times, but this is like the last time I'm going to approach it like you don't know that. Okay, like it's new information. From here on, I'll remind you and all that kind of stuff. We're going to work on the assumption that I get that. I get that if I multiply two numbers together and the answer is zero, one of them, one of the other, has to be That's the last of those. Is there any questions from that or from the homework? Not anymore. Not anymore. That's okay. Does any, uh, for, a, for a piece of candy, does anybody get my the theme of my name?
If you feel like eating candy, you can hand it back to me and I'll give you a, a little extra credit point. For those of two of you that can't Can I give you a pencil and get extra credit? Uh, no. Where would you want a pencil? I bought some pencils. You can look at our objectives over there under algebra 2 and see how they're very similar to the ones from the previous, previous section. What's the slight difference? There's a number in front of x squared. There's a front number in front of x squared and implying that that number is not 1. Right? So far the number has been 1 if you, if you think about it. Uh, in all of these examples, one in front of x squared, one in front of r squared, one in front of y squared, so one in front of x squared. Okay. So what are we going to do? Um, um, so let's. start out just factoring, learning how to factor these things, and then we'll roll that into solving equations. All right. So 7x squared minus 20x minus 3. Okay. I want you to take a stab at factoring that so that when you multiply those two things together, those two factors together, you wind up getting that. ideas out there. So here's those uh, three ideas that I see in main, main ideas. Okay. You know, all of you are making note of the fact that we have a 7x squared and not just an x squared. Okay? Um, let's see this. Let's see this. Let's use this as a, like a starting point. Uh, maybe one of these is correct, 
correct. Maybe all these are correct. Maybe they're all incorrect. What's that? Why is that? So you're going to have to multiply 7x by 7x, and that's going to be 49x squared. So, okay, so that one's incorrect. Um, it's a little harder to see immediately that this one is actually incorrect as well. Because the numerator has to be multiplied 7 by the quotient numbers. Yeah, you're going to multiply these two together, whatever it winds up being, and then multiply everything by 7 and distribute that 7. So, not as quick to see as this, but also turns out that's what I have. So that's I have not going to work. Unless. Unless multiplying 7 through everything after you're done multiplying those two parentheses together does do the trick. But think about this. If that did work, and you distribute that 7 into all of this stuff after you're done multiplying these two together, then wouldn't all of these be multiples of 7? So I'd like to think probably this guy right here. Well, now that we are here, we're left trying to find those other two numbers. Yeah? Okay, so let's ask ourselves, what do we know for sure about those two numbers? They must have a mean thing. Absolutely, they have to. They're the only two constants in there, and they're going to multiply together, and this is the only, you know, we're only going to get this constant from one combination. The constant times the constant when we're multiplying these together. So you just have this, and and we'll do the constants together to add negative three. So how do we multiply to get negative three? Positive one, negative three. Positive one, negative three. Now, here's the thing. That could be positive one here, negative three here. That could be uh, negative one here and three here. That could be uh, positive uh, three here, negative one here, and negative three here, positive one here. Are each of those going to be different? No? Yeah. Yeah? Why are they going to be different? Uh, you got the 7 that we didn't have before. We didn't have 7s. We just had x and x. So whether we put it here or there, the 3 was there, the, as long as we had the signs correct, it didn't make a difference. And that not only can the signs be different, but like where they are is going to make a difference. Right? So this is kind of like four possibilities. So we know we need to go uh, wind up getting negative 20 when we add them together. So when this number gets multiplied by 7 and this one multiplied by 1, then when you add it together, it needs to add to negative 20. Okay? So we could just throw them in there in the order that I wrote them down. We could do, uh, well, let's do it this way then, because that first one is correct. All right. So this is going to give us definitely 7x squared. This is definitely going to give us negative 3. But then we get negative 3x and 7x. That adds together to 4x. 7x minus 3x. 7x minus 3x is going to be 4x. So that doesn't work. OK, so we'll try positive 3 and negative 1. Right, so that gives us 3x and negative 7x, but that just gives us negative. Well, we got positive and negative there, so I'm going to try positive 1 and negative 3. 
less aggressive. We got seven times uh, seven x times negative two. That's negative twenty one x, and we have positive one x, and that does it. Negative twenty one x and positive x add to negative twenty x. So it's this one that turns out to work. Well, we could use some there's some um, some thought. Process of elimination, get rid of some ones that don't make any sense. Uh, we got a pretty big number we need to add to, so probably that seven needs to get the larger of the two factors so that it'll get be a big enough number so we add up to negative 20. But, uh, well, this process kind of stinks. Right, so we have that seven there. And maybe you say that's not too bad, but that's only, there was only one way to factor seven, so we knew one of them had to be seven. One of them had to be seven x. And there was only one way to factor three, one times three, okay? So for this one, it's not too bad. It's just four possibilities. We try four things. We eliminate at most three of them, and then we find that the fourth one works. So here's the problem. So about 12x squared plus 36x plus 24. one of these is going to have a number in front of it. Two Wait, can be like, what? Go ahead and just solve it. Oh, no, no, solve it already. Should have started earlier, even so not starting early enough. <laughs> uh, at least it's going to be 12 times 1, right? 12x times 1x. Maybe that's not it. Maybe it's uh, 6 and 2. Maybe it's 3 and 4. Right? So lots of different possibilities. Could be 12 and 1. Then we move over to 24. We know the two constants are going to make 24. There's not really any complication there. But this could be uh, 24 and 1. This could be uh, 12 and 2. This could be 6 and uh, 4. This could be 8 and 3. Right? And then they like, have to come together. So if I'm just randomly assigning them and guessing, well, this, has, this could be 1 and 12. And then the other two numbers could be any of these four. Right? So that's already four. Maybe none of those work. 
So then we tried three and four, and then we had to try all four of these again. But those didn't work. Maybe we tried six and two, and then maybe at the very end, we finally figure out that eight and three doesn't work either. So we just tried 12 different possibilities, which we still still don't do that. And then imagine if I put a negative in there, we got lots of different combinations of that, because then you can take these and swap them between the two parentheses. So it's really a pain if we're guessing and checking. We don't have a better way. How does eight times three work? Huh? How does eight times three work? Eight times three yeah. is twenty-four. Yeah, but how do you get thirty-six out of that? Well, here's the thing: these numbers don't add together to make thirty-six. Yeah. One of them is going to get multiplied by this number. The other one's going to get multiplied by this number, and then now those numbers together. Three x here and four x here, because three x times four x makes twelve x squared. Right. Or it could be six and two. Six x times two x is twelve x squared. Right. Maybe you found it. Maybe it is twelve. <laughs> you might not be wrong. I mean, but I got twelve x squared plus twelve x plus twelve times x plus two. Twelve x plus twelve. Yeah. Or twelve x squared plus twelve. No, the fact that I got twelve x plus twelve uh, times x plus two. I got that too. But it's still wrong. Let's try it. Twelve x plus what? Twelve. Twelve. And two x plus two. No, not two x. Just x. Oh yeah, just x. Just x. <laughs> just x plus two. Let's see. Twelve x squared. Plus 24x plus 12x plus 24. That does it. 12x squared plus 36x plus 24. Oh. Okay. So we found it. I can't draw. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can use a and 3. You can use a and 4. 3x. Now, if this works, then we did this wrong. Like we multiplied this out wrong. Because right? what I said the other time, or maybe I didn't say it in this class, when you factor it, there's only one way to factor it. There's a unique factorization. So either we multiply this together wrong, or this doesn't work. So let's see what happens. So uh, 12x squared plus 24x plus uh, 12x. Here's what, here's the thing. Um, notice how if I multiply this by uh, 4, if I distribute a 4 in here, I get this one. Right? Mm -hmm. So I could write, oh, what's going on here? No, it's, if we multiply this by um, 4 and this by Multiply that by four and that by two, then we wind up getting this, which is a point that I wanted to make here in a minute. So there's only one way to factor it if, if we go back here, if none of these, if all of these don't share a factor, as they all do, right? That's what it's best for. Which we should go back and, and talk about that in a second. So because they all they they share factors, they share factors of twelve, uh, then that causes an issue. Um, so let's look at that. Uh, now I remember why I didn't like this example last year. It's the same exact thing that happened. Um, is this the same as that? Distribute 12, you get the same thing. And this one even can approach as the original uh, kind of quadratic x plus 2 and x plus 1. Um, so let's 
let me just grab another example real quick. If, if it didn't conveniently have a 12 that factored out, then it wouldn't have been so easy. Um, should we solve this next one before you stop us? So now we can't factor out a 12. We can't factor out anything from all of them. They don't all share a common factor. Uh, so we run into that, that same problem where there's so many combinations that it takes a while to check them all. And if that's the way you want to do it, and you just want to check a bunch of combinations, then, then fine. That would be fine. Uh, but what I'm going to show you is a way to do this so that you don't Hopefully it's well established that if we if we didn't do anything else, if I didn't teach you anything else, you would just have to guess and check. You know, we have to find the factors of 15, find the factors of negative 8, and just pair them up until it works. While that works, it takes forever. It takes a while, okay? Unless you're really lucky. So here, unless you're lucky, right? If you get it quickly, it's because you were lucky if you're just deciding the random weird piece. So this big X is just a way to organize the information we're about to put together. Okay? Remember that. We're solving uh, equations, we're factoring quadratics of this form. ax squared plus bx plus c, where a is the coefficient of x squared, b is the coefficient of x, and c is the constant. Okay, so we're just gathering information here. What we're gonna put is a times c right here. Okay. So what's a times c? Um, 15 times negative eight. What's that? 15 times negative 8, which is? Negative 100. And here, we're just going to put B. What's B? Negative 2. Can you handle that? Up to that point. Okay. Now, similarly to, to what we've done before, we're going to find a numbers, two numbers, that multiply to negative 120 and add to negative 2. Multiply to negative 120 and add to negative 2. Same kind of idea as, as last class, right? Finding two numbers that do that. You need a positive and a negative, don't we? Multiply to negative, positive times negative. And then add to negative. So it won't take long. Give it a try. Part, yeah, a little bit, but less than we would for the previous method. Yeah? What is it? Um, negative 10. Negative 10. Negative 10. So a negative 12 yeah. and 10, so that we come out with negative 2. All right. So all that was to find these two numbers. These are the two numbers that are important to us. Well, these add together to make negative 2, right? That was on purpose. So we could write negative 2x, or we could write 10x plus negative 12x, or 10x minus 12x. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to rewrite this as 10x minus 12x. <coughs> 15x squared plus 10x minus 12x minus 8. circles here just to draw your attention to them. We don't need anything mathematical. So I'm not using parentheses because that would be confusing. I'm just saying look at those two and look at those two. We're just grouping them into two groups of two. So two binomials. Two binomials. So we look at this binomial. Do they have any factors in common? Five. Five. And X. So 
that if we distribute it into here, we're going to wind up with this. So we get 3x plus 2. Agreed? Okay. We do the same thing for these. Negative 4. Negative 4. I like it. Negative 4. And that's it. Right? That's the biggest form. x plus so if I distribute this negative 4, you have negative, uh, oh sorry, 3x plus 2. Uh, negative 12x and negative 8. Okay, everything we did set us up for this moment. What do you notice about the two sets of parentheses? They're the exact same thing. All right? So, just to make, try to make clear what this next step is doing. We're going to go back to this example. How do we go from here to here? Factor what? Factor of the constant. This expression? Factor it out, factor out of 5x, because they both have a 5x factor, right? And if I distribute the 5x, I get this. OK. Well, this is 15x squared plus 10x, right? Two terms. Well, this is a term, and we got a minus, so we got a second term. Now, both of these terms also have a common factor. These two had a common factor of 5x, so we factored out that 5x. This factor and this factor have a common factor of 3x plus 2. Right? Factors mean we're multiplying, right? We're multiplying to the whole parentheses, so 3x plus 2 is the common factor. Put a box around it. 3x plus 2. 3x plus 2. So the same way that we factored out the 5x from these two, we can factor out the 3x plus 2 out of these two. 3x plus 2. 5x minus 4. 5x minus 4. You can see that if I take this parentheses, this whole thing, right, rather than multiplying them together like we normally do, each element times the other, we just distribute the parentheses into the other parentheses. This times 5x gives us this times 5x. And this times negative 4 gives us this times negative 4. Oh. And it's factored. If we multiply it together like normal, we'll get 15x squared minus 2x minus 8. So we're just figuring out different ways of manipulating to make it look different. Well, that's all we've ever done. Okay. Uh, I mean, other than that, it's the same as before. It's going to be set equal to zero. If it's not a set equal to zero, then make the other side zero by subtracting or adding whatever number is over there, bring it over to the other side. Um, factor, guessing and checking if you want, okay, but I think we saw that takes a long time. This is more exact, and on average, it'll take less time. But other than that, if this was equal to zero, what would we do next? How would we solve for x? factor out of all of them, like this one, like 12, do that first. It makes it a lot easier. If you leave it in there, you'll still get it done. But the numbers will be bigger, the factors will be bigger, and it will be more of a challenge. Okay? Thank you guys.